If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, how come you get punished, including by the law, for calling it a duck? Which part of fascism in action are you not recognizing on the streets and alleyways in the dust and gore and destruction in Gaza and indeed in the rampage like drunken sailors killing and stealing as they go in the occupied West Bank, a territory for which the so-called international community has full legal responsibility. And as they prepare for a gigantic seismic Russian victory in Ukraine, the mantra has gone in the West from as long as it takes to as long as we can. Mr. Zelensky, no longer effectively the president of the Ukraine, which no longer effectively exists as a state, went to Washington and asked for $66 billion and left with $300 million. And whether that will ever be delivered, at least to him, is a moot point. This is episode 299 of this iteration of the mother of all talk shows. On the brink of an auspicious number on Sunday, let's make it a bumper night. It's the mother of all talk shows. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. It is an open secret. Zelensky, Ukraine and NATO have comprehensively lost the war. Stop the war, you fools, as Colonel Douglas McGregor, one of our great guests this evening, is fond of saying. Well, of course, they could have stopped the war hundreds of thousands of lives ago when an agreement was in sight, initialed on the table in Ankara in Turkey until Boris Johnson on the instructions of genocide, Joe Biden flew in to say we must fight on. He had no intention of fighting on himself, of course. He's never fought anything in his puff. He meant that we would fight on to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. And that last drop is fast approaching. The Ukrainians cannot find enough soldiers even to man the fortifications they are hurriedly digging. Not only is it now comprehensively, in fact universally accepted, that the so-called counter-offensive, which the NATO powers pushed Ukraine into launching for purely filmic televisual reasons, has not only failed but has become a cataclysmic reverse. Not only did the Ukrainians lose tens, scores of thousands of dead men, but they have lost the territory that they thought they were going to be able to defend. Now it is universally accepted, though only uh, systematically leaked in the top people's papers, In the top people's magazines, the FT, the Daily Telegraph, the Economist, and so on, it is accepted, nonetheless, that Russia's advance, when it begins, will go exactly as far as President Putin decides he wants it to go. They are desperately now looking for a way out. Can they negotiate some kind of freeze on the conflict? That's certainly Joe Biden's wish who said that he wants this war over. Because in an election year, a series of military disasters with a Russian advance going farther and farther into Western Ukraine is just about the last thing he needs on top of the horrific pictures which continue to circulate around America and around the war from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. They want to freeze the conflict a la North and South Korea. But that would require Russia to agree to freeze the conflict. And why would they do that now that everyone agrees they are winning? I remain of the view, oft expressed on this show, that Russia will seek to liberate not just the city of Odessa, 
the quintessentially Russian Jewish city of Odessa, but all of the coastline and linking up with Transnistria. And they will insist on a government in Kiev for the rump, stump, Western Ukrainian state that is entirely loyal to Moscow and not to Brussels and not to Washington. That will require seismic political change in Kiev. They're already preparing for that. The mayor of Kiev, Klitschko, the famous boxer, and uh, the Zaluzhny, the head of the armed forces, are definitely a gathering storm for President Zelensky. It's quite likely that before long, and perhaps before the New Year chimes have died away, Zelensky will be on a private plane for Miami or for exile in one of the sumptuous homes he has now miraculously become the owner of. What does that mean? Where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in Europe cold, hungry, jobless, underemployed, and increasingly forlorn and hopeless about our future. It leaves us with a set of leaders who in 2024 will have to be removed from office because they have committed the cardinal sin of committing national suicide on television. They have committed the cardinal sin of cutting the wrists of their own people and of their own country, their own economy, just to please genocide Joe Biden. As I said on Wednesday, it's one thing to be a vassal of Rome. Julius Caesar was quite the thing. But to be a vassal of Joe Biden, who can't chew gum, walk in a straight line at the same time, who can't tie his shoelaces, who can't put on his shoes, who doesn't know where he is or what he's saying. This week, he told us that October 7th was 65 years ago. So sure of it, he said it three times, that instead of 65 days ago, it was 65 years ago. That meant his father could have a walk-on part. He told us that his father had gone back to his kibbutz, to look for clothes and artifacts to rescue from the ruins of his house. I'm not making that up. It's easily accessible on the internet for anyone who wants to see it. You really would laugh unless you were already crying. That our leaders, so-called social democrats, so-called greens, in some cases, so-called socialists, have done all this help Joe Biden throw that huge boomerang at President Putin, only for it to come back and chop the heads of our own people, of our own governments, is almost too much to bear. But what does it mean for President Putin? Well, looking at the poll we're running tonight, which leader commands more respect around the world, Biden or Putin? Well, I'll let you look at the numbers because I can scarcely believe them. 28,407 people have voted. And in one case, 1% 1 of those responding believe that Biden commanded more respect around the world. And that 1%, I'm sure, were exclusively billeted in Broadmoor, the hospital for the criminally insane in the south of England. On Twitter, only 5% thought Biden commanded more respect. On the YouTube community stream, 3% thought it was Biden. On the YouTube stream of this show itself, 4% thought Biden. These are numbers not to be sneered at. Sure, it's not scientific, but it is massive. It is a poll of almost 30,000 people, and I predict it will be 30,000 people by the end of this show in which 99, 95, 97, and 96% of the people think that Putin commands more respect around the world. And as a matter of objective truth, who among you can possibly doubt that that is the case? Gayatri and I were in the United Arab Emirates when President Putin arrived last week. 
The sky was painted red, white, and blue. The cavalcade, the welcome from a historically pro-American Gulf country had to be seen to be believed. No Russian leader, even at the height of Soviet power, with their alliance with Nasser in Egypt, ever received a welcome like this in the Arab and Muslim world. The same was true when he flew on to Saudi Arabia and then flew to Moscow to receive the president of Iran, President Raisi. The prestige of Russia, the standing of Russia in the world has to be seen to be compared with Russia lying drunk on the floor under President Yeltsin, having its pocket picked by Western businessmen and Western governments. Now, Russia has won the war in Ukraine. What will happen next? Well, one thing I predict, neither Russia nor China, and certainly not both of them together, are ever going to be pushed around by NATO by the United States ever again in any place, anywhere in the world. The world changed, I believe, last Wednesday when President Putin arrived in the Persian Gulf. It will be seen historically as the turning point in world affairs when multipolarity became a real thing, when the end of unipolar power of American NATO hegemony died a death in the deserts of the Gulf. And the first place that will be tested will be in Palestine. The conflict there, now three quarters of a century old, more than three quarters of a century old, will have to be brought to a conclusion. And that conclusion is not the one that Netanyahu wants and not the one that has been secretly enabled by the European and North American powers. What do I mean by that? Well, on paper, all of the Western governments support a Palestinian state, the so-called two-state solution. All of them, including the United States itself. After all, the Oslo agreements were signed on American soil in the garden of the White House. So everybody in the West is committed to this so-called two-state solution, a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, and including all of the territories of the West Bank occupied militarily since 1967 and the Gaza Strip, and a contiguity between the two parts of that Palestinian state. But here's the rub. Not only is Netanyahu making it clear that there will be no Palestinian state, but more, he is the only man who can stop a Palestinian state being formed. Now, there comes a point at which uh, this circle cannot be squared. If all the European governments, all the North American governments are committed to a Palestinian state, but they are also arming, funding, proselytizing for a government of Israel, which makes it clear there will never be a Palestinian state. The point at which that contradiction can be masked, can be obfuscated, has now passed. Because Russia and China are about to launch a political and diplomatic initiative which will impose that so-called two-state solution, will impose a Palestinian state, and will force all these hypocrite governments that claim that they support such an outcome to come off the fence and to support it. And it's pregnant with the possible rupture and breach, fundamental and final, of the United Nations itself. After all, the Security Council voted with one vote against to demand a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. The United States vetoed it. The General Assembly 
of the United Nations. Voted with only 10 states against. Well, I say states, but they included Vanuatu, they included the Marshall Islands, they included Micronesia, they included Paraguay, and they included, of course, Israel and the United States itself. The 10 dwarfs, or eight dwarfs, and Israel and the United States, and then every other country in the world backing the ceasefire and the rapid movement towards a political solution so that this ghastly horror that we have been watching for not 65 years, Joe Biden, but it feels like 65 years. For me, it's not that far off 65 years because I've been watching these things. Sometimes there, while they were happening, I have been watching these things for more than half a century. But there comes a point at which all the legal efforts, political efforts, policing efforts, to deny people the right to compare what's happening to the Palestinians in their ghetto in Gaza, in their ghetto in the West Bank, with what happened to Jews in the Holocaust of the Second World War, will not be able to succeed. After all, if you are watching, as anyone with access, admittedly fewer than there were a week ago in Britain, access to the Al Jazeera television network, already knows that in a United Nations school, Abu Ghazali school, a United Nations school. Women, children, and men were summarily executed at point blank range in a United Nations school over the last 24, 36 hours. People can see the three little girls on the roof watching their father burning alive. Everyone has seen it. Everyone has seen the 25,000 children in Gaza who have now lost one or both of their parents. 25,000 orphans, 10,000 dead children, 5,000 dead women. Everyone has seen it. We know what fascism looks like. We studied the Holocaust. Some of us campaigned to make it a criminal offense to deny the Holocaust. But we are being asked to deny a new Holocaust in 2023. No thanks. A woman, that were, remember I told you on Wednesday, they were looking for a nice peaches and cream, English, middle class, white woman. They were looking for her because of a placard that she carried. I've now seen the placard. The placard merely compares what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust and what's happening to the Palestinians in Gaza. Well, I've got news for you, Inspector Plod. We all can see that. I'm not a placard carrier myself, but let me metaphorically show it to you now, Inspector Plod. The comparison between what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust and what's happening to the Palestinians right now, this day, this evening, is so brazen, so blatant, so vivid, so streaked in red blood of innocent people that only someone willfully blind or somebody evil would continue to deny it. Now, I believe that Israel is led by evil men. I have no doubt that after Netanyahu, another incarnation or iteration of evilness will come to power. I believe that some of our leaders are idiots and some of them are evil. But I don't believe that our people are either idiots or evil. The British people, the French, the European people, 
the American people, the Canadian people, have all shown over the last 65, now 66 days, that when they cut them, we know that they surely bleed just like us. Their blood looks like ours. The cries of their children sound like ours. The grief of their parents feels like ours. This is not a world in which, in far off countries, of which we know little, all kinds of horrors and crimes can be committed. This is a world in which we see them almost in real time. We can watch them live being butchered, and we will not put up with it anymore. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. It's the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows podcast with George Galloway. Mr. Mohammed Hijab has turned out to be one of the outstanding figures, thinker and a talker in this conflict and indeed long before, one of the most successful ever guests on the mother of all talk shows. He's the co-founder of the Sapiens Institute. He's an author and a political commentator and we are always glad to have him on the mother of all talk shows. Mohammed, uh, welcome uh, back. Uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, what's your well, you take me. on the, the wreckage now, the wreckage of United Nations resolutions ignored, Security Council resolutions vetoed, United Nations schools used as the site of massacre? Doesn't the current international system look to you as it does to me like a complete basket case. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, one thing I would say is um, it, one thing I'm reminded of is Shakespeare's saying that uh, not all the all the um, perfumes of Arabia cannot sweeten thy hand. And I know you used that yourself in one of your very famous interviews uh, in the past with one of the politicians of this country. And that is what comes to mind, that what can be said and done after what we have seen um, absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned before, before I've come on, uh, the, the countries that actually didn't uh, vote for the ceasefire in the uh, UN and the Security Council, some of them I didn't even know were countries, frankly. I mean, as you put it, Micronesia and these kind of things, I didn't know that that was actually even a country uh, in itself. So it's very odd and unusual. Obviously, in the in Europe, uh, Czech Republic, the Czech Republic and Austria were the two countries that uh, voted against the ceasefire. I was surprised to see that India voted for it, for example, and we've seen that their rhetoric has been uh, f very, uh, you know, pro-Israel, and they actually voted for the ceasefire. So I think with this level of international consensus, this level of international agreement between countries, um, I mean, it's only a matter of time now, actually. Even Biden, his his parlance has, has shifted. And we're starting to see some level of difference between the American interest and the Zionist interest. Uh, and it would seem to be a matter of maybe weeks uh, or months be before uh, further action is taken. Uh, and we hope that the ceasefire is obviously uh, done. But, I mean, the fact that you still have supporters of something like this after, as you've mentioned, the kind of wreckage has been barbaric, frankly, um, is, is something which, uh, which beggars belief fully. You see, I, I know that these things have happened before. They happened in the 20th century, never mind in medieval times. The Holocaust itself, if it had been televised, uh, would have uh, dwarfed in scale and numbers, uh, if not in uh, quality, so to speak. Uh, it would have dwarfed it. Uh, millions and millions of people uh, butchered. But the difference is, in times gone by, we... We, we didn't get to see it. We got to see the death camps liberated, all, almost all of them by the Russians, by the way. Uh, we saw the survivors of the Holocaust, but we didn't see the people being massacred in the Holocaust. But now we are watching 
the people being massacred. It's unbearable, surely. What kind of human being could look at what we're now looking at and not demand an end to this? I mean, I'm, I'm also reminded of another saying that you uh, famously said, which is that we're seeing proponents of the West fight to the last drop in other people's blood. And the opponents of Zionism are doing exactly uh, that. What I found more repugnant than the ones who are perpetrating these crimes are the ones who are supporting these crimes without having to bear any of the risk of, of those crimes. They don't have to put themselves the tin hat and go forward and fight themselves. They are the ones who are letting other people do that work for them. And they don't mind to see civilians dying in the tens of thousands. Uh, they don't even mind to see their own soldiers who they support dying uh, now in the hundreds. Uh, the Israeli soldiers are dying in the hundreds. And in fact, every day we're seeing a batch of young men in Israel, uh, 18 to 25 or 30 or that kind of age, uh, even women, young women being killed and slaughtered on the front lines uh, in Israel. And this is something which uh, many people, as I say, they are willing uh, to support, but they would never be willing to put their own sons or their own selves uh, on the front line doing that work. So it's it's absolutely repugnant. And I think it's it's akin or comparable, at least, to the South African experience. In terms of civilian death, it's, it's more dramatic than the South African experience. And uh, in terms of, there was one particular study that came out recently from Haaretz, where a sociologist... Um, uh, where a social, and this has actually been reported I thought, by The Guardian as well, uh, was looking at the death counts and doing a ratio study. And he stated that this is, uh, in terms of the time period, one of the bloodiest um, you know, death tolls for civilians in the time period that it's had in the 20th century, for the time period. So it's absolutely uh, shocking. And uh, the fact that we can see it makes things even worse. Uh, and to be honest with you, in terms of the, the Holocaust, I mean... There was something called the Evian Conference. I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but there was an opportunity for the Western countries to take in Jewish people. What they saw was uh, this Jewish problem. I think it was in the late 1930s. And they didn't do it uh, because anti-Semitism was rife even in Western Europe. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a common misconception that people think that uh, the Holocaust was understood or known uh, at the time of the when the Allies were fighting the Axis, it wasn't. A lot of these death camps were obviously discovered afterwards. Uh, however, having said that, uh, as you've said, if it was something that the whole world would see, I would think that they would have a different attitude. But we saw many people of the German population, they knew something about what was happening, and they did turn a blind eye. And likewise, we're seeing many people in the Western world, they know and they can see what's happening, and they are turning their blind eye. Now, um, I, I spent a, a long time in Parliament, as you know, Mohammed, and in much of it, uh, the the air was full of fear of the radicalization, as they always put it, uh, of Muslims, of Muslim youth. Uh, they feared that the Iraq war, the Afghan war, the aftermath of both uh, would uh, sharply uptick uh, the level of radicalization and the danger of young Muslims being lured onto the rocks of separatism and violence. Uh, they had multi-million pound uh, programs, uh, Prevent and so on, uh, which uh, weren't very successful, but you knew at least why they were doing these things. They had a legitimate fear of radicalization. I used to say... You know, a Muslim watching on television what's happening in Iraq, what's happening in Afghanistan, is likely to feel pretty radical. There's no need for a cleric uh, to wind them up. There's no need for a pamphlet uh, to, to tool them. They have their, their eyes. They can see what's happening to their co-religionists. So how radical are Muslims around the world feeling right now, watching what's happening in Gaza? It's a really good question. And I think what's really interesting is that, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden himself and members of Al-Qaeda and, um, you know, all the, the associated kind of groups, they would use these kinds of atrocities happening, especially in Palestine, 
as the key way of recruiting uh, other people. I mean, the fatwa is that Osama bin Laden put forward, you will see, and this, that's the reason why it went viral um, some weeks ago, in fact, they were reading, people were reading the fatwas because a, a big chunk of it was actually dedicated to the Palestine issue. Now, um, if in terms of what these uh, particular groups uh, actually espouse, what they espouse is that if they kill our civilians, this is effectively a pragmatic kind of consequentialist reasoning. Now, they think that this consequentialism, uh, this Sharia consequentialism is acceptable from an Islamic perspective, which it isn't because there's been a consensus for 1,400 years on the matter. And we can, we can quote the classical sources, Ibn Abdul Bar and others from the, from the 13th century that said there's a consensus on not killing the civilians. But they would use a kind of consequentialist reasoning by saying that actually they're killing our civilians. And so therefore we can kill their civilians. And they will quote verses from the Quran. Uh, effectively alluding to the fact that it's a knife or an eye. فَإِذَا عُقِبْتُمْ فَعَقِبُوا وَمِثْلِ مَا عُقِبْتُمْ بِهِ If you are if you're going to receive consequence, so impose consequence the way in which you receive the consequence. So they generalize the principle and they say, in fact, what that means is if they kill our civilians, we can kill their civilians. And so they use an emotional kind of argumentation and a pragmatic kind of consequentialist reasoning in order to get new recruits. Now, this is a concern. It's a real problem because it flies in the face of Sharia law. It's not it's not normative in any way, shape or form. But because of the compelling nature of the emotional aspect of this, when a young man who's not acquainted with the minutiae of jurisprudential um, uh, you know, legalities in Islamic law is presented with a picture of some kid being blown up and then being told, actually, there is some Islamic justification, it gives it does actually give fuel or adds fuel to the fire of Islamic, uh, for example, uh, takfirism, I would call it. And these groups become more relevant. So in other words, there is a threat here that the Muslim uh, population and the Western populations have to be weary of. And it is a threat that some young men are going to be looking at these things and thinking, well, they're killing our civilians. Maybe we have to go and kill theirs, which is a misnotion in Islamic uh, jurisprudence. But why do we want that environment to be uh, to, to, to be acceptable or to be creating a facilitation for that kind of environment again? And this is something that the Western governments and powers have to look at because we don't want to see young Muslim people in this country or anywhere else being uh, radicalized to that effect. Quite so. Uh, and of course, what's true in Britain will, in terms of quantum, be more true in France. Uh, there are nearly 10 million Muslims in France, uh, in Belgium, uh, in, in uh, Germany, uh, in North America even. Uh, it is uh, just another factor. Uh, that we have to put into this equation, we are losing any respect that we had in Muslim countries. I mean, who, if you run this poll uh, that I'm running tonight in Muslim countries, I mean, the, uh, the result would be laughable. We're losing respect and friends. We've lost all the very good friends we used to have in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia, and so on. And we're also placing our own societies in danger, all to support Netanyahu, who is opposed to the outcome that we claim that we support, namely the two-state solution. Make sense of that for me, Mohammed. Absolutely. And I think the Americans know that full well, which is why we're seeing a change in parlance. What, if I had to guess, I would think that the conversation, to put it in simplistic terms, between the Americans and the Israelis at this point is, listen, we're going to give you this amount of time, get the job done, because if you can't get the job done in this amount of time, the status quo cannot remain as it is. It will, un it will unstabilize the region. And for the Americans, I do really think that their interests are slightly different, or at least to a large extent, completely different uh, to the Zionist interests in so much as that they have a, a region they want to protect. Uh, they have trade going through the region. I mean, uh, Yemen, which is the healthy controlled Yemen, uh, you have boats going over carrying trade, which can even easily be pirated and stopped and these kind of things. Massive disruption can take place if Hezbollah gets involved, if, if, if some escalation takes place then they can start des destroying desalinization plants, uh, um, places and um, other things in, in Israel itself. They can start destroying the natural gas uh, re reserves there. There can be uh, things that take place if there's an escalation which will ruin the economy in that area, which will have a trickle-down effect in, in Europe. And, and the Americans know that. It's not just a political and geopolitical issue. It's an economic issue. And they don't want to see 
this region being destabilized because they have plans for that region. And so I do think that there is a discussion that the Americans are having with the Israelis that, listen, this is a, you've got to do this quickly because public opinion is also against us. And, and Biden's got his campaign that he needs to do. And, he, you know, uh, if you look at the polls that have been done on this issue, uh, you'll find that this is not as much a right-left issue as it is a young-old issue, that the ages 18 to 35, yeah. the ones who are exposed to the social media, the, 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 you know, or have access to social media and seeing all these people being killed, which are a key demographic for the for the Democrats, they they will less likely, especially the more, definitely the Muslim community in, in America, but certainly other communities as well, to vote for the Democrats ever again if this continues. So there are so many things which make this not worthwhile for the Americans, which I'm sure uh, are being put into uh, consideration by them. And so that's why you're seeing a change in parlance with with some of Biden's words. And I think that that's the best way to predict what's going to happen in the future. Look at what's in the interest of the Americans. Uh, and in this case, we know in the interest of the Americans to stabilize the region for trade purposes, for geopolitical purposes, so that they can have, uh, for, for them, they can have the colonial outpost, which is Israel in, in, in the region, being protected because uh, they want to see the protection of Israel as well. Of course, that's, that's something Israel wants as well. It's a joint objective. Uh, however, this is becoming too much now. And I think in about a month or two months time, we're going to see some serious developments. Could be a lot of dead people between now and then. As always, Mohammed Hijab, you're a star player. Thanks for coming on the mother of all talk shows. Let me take a quick break. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Now, Colonel Douglas McGregor, retired, is the CEO of our country, our choice. Uh, and uh, this is a new appointment of his. I'm going to be asking him about that. Uh, but he has another uh, of these, like Mohammed Hijab, who had a level of prominence perhaps in the Beltway, perhaps in some parts of the United States, but has now become a global figure with people looking out for his analysis, his take on world events. There's nothing he doesn't know about war, about defense, about security, about terrorism. He was in the Pentagon. He was in the White House. He might well have become a United States ambassador. Personally, I have greater ambitions for him than that. He is, as I say, once upon a time, a compatriot of mine with a name like Colonel Douglas McGregor. Welcome, uh, Colonel, to the uh, mother of all talk shows. Uh, I'll talk about your new role in a minute, but as you survey the headlines of the top people's papers, hasn't quite filtered down to... Uh, the news they give to the masses yet. But all the top people's papers, all the top people's fora, uh, are all now preparing each other, and ultimately they'll have to prepare us, the public, for a cataclysmic Russian victory in Ukraine. You predicted this all along. Do you feel vindicated? I'd feel better about it if this had ended earlier and fewer Ukrainians and Russians had lost their lives in what is really a pointless conflict that never needed to happen. It's true, isn't it, that uh, every death since the Ankara uh, initial draft peace agreement has in a sense been a death that our governments, yours and mine, bear responsibility for. Because this could all have been over when hundreds of thousands of people that are dead today would still have been alive. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if anything, I would describe this as a Washington vanity project. Lots of people in Washington, supported by friends in London and some other European capitals, decided that uh, they had an opportunity to destroy Russia and that they would use Ukraine for that purpose. And they'd been building up to this for many, many years not just the eight years before the war broke out, but actually even earlier, which helps to explain the coup that, that occurred and the installation of the Zelensky government later on. All of it was, was fantasy. It made no sense. All the underlying assumptions were wrong. Uh, and the usual suspects in the Department of Defense, all of your retired generals and 
active generals, very few of whom ever had any practical military experience and seldom, if ever, bothered to study their professions, all jumped on the bandwagon predicting imminent victory for Ukraine. And everyone lied pr prolifically and with great uh, convincing uh, rhetoric day after day that the Russians were awful, they were losing, they had no chance to win. They still haven't admitted the truth, which is uh, we're looking at roughly half a million dead Ukrainian soldiers. This evening, I heard a retired uh, general say, well, perhaps 125,000. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a fraction of what we know has happened. And he's still trying to make the argument that if we just spend more money and send more equipment, Ukraine will triumph. In reality, the Russians are advancing deliberately, but slowly. I think uh, Mr. Putin is looking for a negotiating partner among the European states. He's not interested in marching to the Polish border. But as I keep telling everyone, if we're stupid enough to refuse to negotiate, if we won't bring this stupid and pointless war to an end, not only will we destroy the Ukrainian nation, but we'll end up moving Russian forces that much further towards the West, which I thought was the uh, very thing we wanted to avoid, uh, as well as the mm -hmm. massive expansion of the Russian armed forces. They are now mammoth, very well staffed, brilliantly officered, well led, well equipped. Uh, this is not what we set out to achieve. So does that make our leaders fools or knaves? Uh, fools because they didn't see what you and I could see, uh, or knaves because they could see it uh, and did it anyway? I think it's probably a little of both. I mean, we've always had a problem. You, you have in Great Britain and we in the United States with senior military and political leaders who tended to be persuaded by wishful thinking that things were true that were not. This is simply another example. And uh, you add to that uh, corruption and greed and arrogance. I think the arrogance in Washington is at an all-time high. One would think after the decades of failure, military and strategic and, and political, and given the state of our economy and the financial system, everyone would have developed some measure of humility. Nothing could be further from the truth. No one will admit the truth. Everyone insists on the lie, and the arrogance continues. It's very disturbing and entirely true also on this side of the uh, Atlantic. Uh, he had a bad Tuesday, Zelensky, uh, in Washington. But w one of our correspondents has just briefed us that he had a better Wednesday. He had all the brass out there to greet him, and Lloyd Austin booming nine different pledges in one minute, 45 seconds. What happened? Well, I think uh, he thought that he had access to the Epstein tapes and he was going to present those to President Biden and his colleagues and tell them he was going to release them if they didn't support him. Doesn't seem to have worked. <laughs> Maybe the tapes weren't good enough. Didn't have enough people on them. I, I don't know. Uh, the generals are just waiting around to retire and uh, pick up lucrative contracts with the defense industry. So they're performing not just for their political sponsors that advanced them to senior rank, they're performing for their future bosses and the shareholders, reassuring them that they can sell anything that they produce to anyone. Whether we win or lose doesn't make any difference. And apparently they, they've got a point. But I think this is going to be tough to conceal. The rest of the world knows what has happened, Mr. Galloway. And what has happened is very clear. Not only has this Western-trained Ukrainian force failed miserably for reasons that are not entirely its fault, but because of the way we trained it, organized it, and equipped it. In addition to that, our technology has failed miserably. Our advice has been appalling. I mean, if you, you know, in retrospect, I'm, I'm surprised uh, President Putin hasn't offered to reimburse London and Washington for the cost of sending all the retired generals over there to advise them because they've been his greatest assets. It's been stupidity on stilts, an unwillingness to see how profoundly warfare has changed, a desire to see Russians as mediocre and subhuman. It's outrageous nonsense. It was never true. And now, as you know, I'm sure you're aware, we've poisoned the well with Russia for at least a decade or more. I can't imagine why the Russians would pay any attention to anything we say. Everything we've told them was a lie. Everything we've done has been aimed at subverting them and alienating them. And I think that's a serious mistake. I, I hope we can get a new generation of political leaders in there that can turn it around. But 
That's, in my judgment, the worst part. And the rest of the world now knows we're weak. And I think that weakness is uh, going to be on display increasingly in the future, and I would include in that the Middle East. We are not the power we were 30 years ago. We're not even close. Uh, well, undoubtedly, and I was speaking earlier, I was in the UAE when President Putin arrived. Uh, you could see, you could feel, it's palpable, uh, the extent to which uh, the uh, formerly, well, to say the least, friends and allies uh, of uh, the West have begun to reorientate towards the East. Um, insofar as we struggled mightily to lift a huge stone, we really have dropped it on our own feet, haven't we? Russia is stronger oh, yeah. and richer. Russia is stronger and militarily more powerful. Its prestige has grown. Its armed forces now tried and tested. Uh, it's a thoroughgoing disaster, all this. And the leaders who led us into it really ought to pay a price if democracy means anything. Hmm. Well, you've got to get people informed. And this is something that's acutely lacking in, in, in the United States. If you ask most Americans, what are you doing tonight? They're looking for the latest football game. They're trying to find out who Taylor Swift is going to date next week. If you ask them about what's happening in the Middle East, they sort of shrug their shoulders. They're not terribly interested. They think this is a minor dust up that will soon be over as was the case in previous occasions with the Israelis and the Arabs. And, you know, Arabs uh, have, have also been through the, the ringer as well here in the United States. It was easy to convince people that Russians were bad simply because of the Cold War. All you had to do was dust off the Cold War propaganda and throw it at them. Well, now you have the same problem, unfortunately, with Muslim Arabs. Oh, Muslim Arabs, we've been fighting them for years. The hell with them. Let's hope the Israelis do a great job with no understanding of the situation, of the humanitarian dimension, and no real interest. This is all going to come back and, and harm us in the long run. But for the moment, strategically, it's not having any impact here. No, nothing is penetrating the American public. The, uh, you're, you know far more about warfare than I, uh, but when I look at the uh, situation in the Gulf, in the Red Sea, uh, it looks to me like the asymmetrical uh, warfare in which the common man can inflict uh, wholly disproportionate damage uh, and cost uh, on his enemy. The Houthis, for example, a ragged-assed army, a kind of Taliban on wheels, uh, now have the ability to bring shipping in the Red Sea uh, to a halt at a cost of an uncountable billions of dollars from, for people having to sail their ships uh, around a continent instead uh, or pay insurance uh, at an exorbitant price because there's a pretty good chance the Houthis will stick a missile up your jumper if you sail past them. Uh, this is a remarkable turnaround, isn't it? Well, the, the Houthis have actually practically shut down the Suez Canal for much of the uh, commercial traffic. Uh, that's a tremendous achievement. We haven't had to have a collision or an explosion in the Suez, and people are now sailing all the way around the Cape to avoid going through the Red Sea. I'm waiting for someone in Washington to make the decision to commit uh, five or 10,000 Marine infantry or something to land in Yemen and, you know, based on the experience in Yemen that the British had, uh, I, can, I can only imagine that that would be a very unrewarding experience dealing with the Houthis and running around in the mountains down there. Uh, no one wants to talk to anybody. Again, you know, before you launch, why not talk to people? You know, one thing that the British always did very well before they went anywhere is that they, they answer, ask this question, how do we practice economy of enemies? Who will work with us? And who won't? And eventually, they narrowed it down to just a very small number of people who would oppose them. And they had help from others around them. That was uh, Sir Richard Francis Burton, who was a genius at this sort of thing, the real James Bond of the 19th century. We don't have anybody thinking like that. We go in with a sledgehammer. We smash everything. We smash everybody. And then we wonder why nobody likes us and everybody wants us out. We have no friends today in Iraq. 
Nobody in Syria wants this except some of the Kurds, and it's not even all the Kurds. It's a minority of them. But we've managed to alienate the Iranians, the Turks, as well as all of the Arabs. So I think we're in for a long war. People think, well, you know, the Israelis will finish up in Gaza over the next few weeks. Well, finish up means expel or kill everybody who's left. Now they're t- now they're going to pump some seawater into the tunnels. I'm sure that'll get rid of some of them, uh, in addition to destroying the water table and making the place unlivable. But I, I see this as dragging on. I see things changing in the Muslim world. And there's this concept called uh, Asadiyya that goes back to Ibn Khaldun, the famous uh, Muslim historiographer. And he talked about uh, social cohesion and the impact of Islam on the peoples that lived within the Islamic world. And he said, you know, no one has ever seen the power of Islam uh, uh, fully appreciates what it can do. Well, today the world is different. The people in this region are better educated, they have access to technology, and they know what's happening. Hundreds of millions of people, Turks, Arabs, Iranians, Egyptians, everyone knows what's happening. Anyone who thinks that this is going to end soon is wrong. I think this is the beginning of a very dangerous period. And frankly, I think the Israelis have uh, grossly underestimated the impact of their actions. And at the same time, we don't seem to understand it. We're sitting out there on board our aircraft carriers, waiting for the word to fly strikes. And we're trying very hard to to split the the Lebanese government from Hezbollah, cutting deals and agreements in the hopes that that will keep Hezbollah out. But in the long run, I don't see that happening. I think things are going to get worse, particularly in the spring. We may have a pause, a temporary ceasefire, but this is going to turn into a long, ugly war that none of us are going to like. The, I know you're a patriotic American, and I, I swear I, I say this not to hurt your feelings at all. But as I watch the decline, steep and rapid, of your president, uh, such that in his latest pronunciamento, uh, he, th- he, he thrice declared, that the events of October 7th were 65 years ago instead of 65 days ago. And that allowed him to have a walk-on part for his father, his father, who died 20 years ago, uh, returning to uh, his kibbutz. Uh, This is not a well man. Uh, As we say in Scotland, you would not send that man out for a loaf never mind to rule and govern the most uh, powerful uh, country in the world, of, of how much more of this can the American people put? Well, a, lo- a lot of us have asked that question. <clears throat> I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind that uh, Biden is not governing anything. And whatever he says, whatever he uh, signs is put in front of him by other people. The other people are committed to two things. They're committed to the extension of this war in Ukraine. They're committed to unlimited spending. They're committed to uh, backing whatever is required in the Middle East that Israel demands. And uh, they control events. The American people, as I said, aren't paying a great deal of attention right now. But it, it will take something major to get their attention, something that hits them at home. Now, we've got problems here. Don't Don't mistake that. We have open borders rising criminality. Lots of Americans are saying, sure, we like the Israelis, but why are we sending all of this money to Israel and Ukraine when we have open borders, when when we can't even maintain effective armed forces, when people won't join it? I mean, all this diversity, inclusion, and equity is killing us in the, in the military. And we have so denigrated the role that men play, particularly white men, that uh, the armed forces are suffering for that dramatically. You know, somebody once said, uh, was complaining about the numbers of British soldiers, and Disraeli made the comment, no one complained about the numbers of British soldiers at Waterloo. Well, I like to point out that no one complained about the numbers of white men fighting in the armed forces at Okinawa or Midway or Normandy or anywhere else. But we're we're in a lot of trouble, Mr. Galloway. We've lost our, our way. We've lost our sense of purpose. We've lost our sense of identity. And all of these things are going to come out in the, in the months ahead. And I hope that we can weather this and recover. 
But right now we are admittedly in a lot of trouble and we are not in a position to wage a major regional war. And no one should exclude that possibility. That could happen. There are a lot of people in Washington working closely with uh, Jerusalem to spark a war with Iran. And uh, that would be, in my judgment, both unnecessary and catastrophic. If that happens, uh, anyone who thinks that Russia will stand by and watch us destroy Iran is crazy. And the Chinese at this point have enormous investments in the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. They depend heavily on the oil and gas. They don't want to see that shut down. So you're, you're talking about this, the simple truth is this. No one in the region, in the Near East or Southwest Asia or Eastern Europe, wants a war except us. Chilling indeed. Tell us about your new role, uh, Colonel, uh, our country, our choice. What What is that and what do you hope to achieve? <clears throat> our country, our choice was formed before I showed up by a group of people who simply decided it doesn't make any difference for whom we vote. We get the same bad policies. They've discovered that we have this thing called the Uniparty, where everyone has his hand out, everyone's enriching him or herself, and that's why you don't have debates. You have very few discussions. The fight is over money. It's not over anything of substance. And we're busy falling all over ourselves to ship money overseas, largely because it results in arms sales that enrich people, and no one gives a damn about our border. Oh, a few people raise their hands and say, well, this is bad. That's unfortunate. No one seems to care about the rule of law. So they said, would you come in and be the CEO and try to be a spokesman for the people in the United States who feel disenfranchised? And our numbers are growing rapidly. I think they're going to grow a lot more next year as people begin to figure out, why should I worry about who wins the election when everything stays the same? Who's really going to step forward with a new team and say, it's over? We're going to stop it. Who's going to really cut spending? It's impossible. Uh, you can't cut spending. We have to print more money. Well, the more you do, the more likely you are to fall apart. Everybody in the United States understands this, but now I see tens of thousands of people who are coming forward and, and want this to end. So there are a lot of other issues that we don't like. We don't like the sexualization of children. You know, we're tired of the human trafficking as well as the drugs that pour into our country. We're tired of criminals who are not tried and, and dealt with as harshly as possible. But everything's out of control. Our, our Internally, we are crumbling. And everybody knows it. And that includes hundreds of thousands of veterans who are going to flock to our colors because they see nowhere else to go and they're sick of it because many of them have suffered terribly. And the question is, for what? What did we achieve in Afghanistan? What did we achieve in Iraq? What did we achieve anywhere? Well, we all know the answer. Strategically, for us, nothing. But lots of people in Washington live at the top of the food chain. They're doing quite well. In the meantime, food is up 35% and it's getting worse. People are having trouble putting food on the table. Not in Washington. No, not, not in the gated neighborhoods, not in Manhattan. You know, we're talking about the average American. This, this is not going to go on long. So this is what we're about. And uh, we want to end these overseas conflicts. We want to defend the border. We want to expel the illegals. We want to restore the rule of law. But at the same time, I'm, we're getting a lot of inquiries from overseas. In fact, a number of people from the continent, India, uh, are asking questions, can we form a similar chapter? And I think that could happen at some point. And what we're doing now is we're benefiting from the investment that many people are making. We're trying to make it possible for people to join us without spending any money. But the last thing we want to do is take money from Americans who need it. That's extraordinarily powerful uh, message. And I, I know about messaging. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I feel there is, uh, I don't know, an overlap perhaps with Mr. Carlson, Tucker Carlson, who is also uh, an extremely powerful exponent uh, of uh, the kind of counsel uh, of despair uh, at the political class in Washington. Have you thought about joining up together, you and Tucker? Well, he's been very supportive of us to this point. But we really have spent the last uh, several months building up a new platform. We're going to build a media platform, and we're trying to build membership. We put those together, and our members will then get uh, 
fact-based news and information. We're also sick to death of the mainstream media. We, we don't need opinion-based news. What we need to know is what's really happening. You know, stop lying to us about losses. Stop lying to us about the health of our economy. Stop lying to us about criminality. Stop lying to us about the border. We're not stupid. We know we're being lied to. So we're trying to put together something that will stream routinely real fact-based news. And you know that sounds easy. It's not. Because when you go on the internet, it's very tough to sort truth from fiction. And occasionally we all make mistakes. But uh, we've got to try it. And I think we're going to be successful. But it's going to take time. The more money that comes in, the sooner we, the sooner we go further. And uh, we're going to get a lot of good people, too, to come on board with this that are going to help with the news part. We've got a lot of writers that are coming in helping to take information, turn it into bites of, say, five to 800 words that people can understand. But we're at the beginning, Mr. Galloway. We're just starting. And I think this could be something that a lot of people in a lot of countries would appreciate. Could well be. Colonel Douglas McGregor, thanks as always for being on the mother of all talk shows. Quick break uh, now from me and then Chicago and Essex on the line. Told you we're a global university of the airwaves. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Let's go to Morocco, who wouldn't, where Michael wants to talk about Piers Morgan. Go ahead, Michael. I got a problem with Pat Morgan from from October 7th. His show is based on October 7th, and all the program you talk about, Hamas is terrorist. I disagree that Hamas is terrorist. Uh, before October 7th, the Palestinians have been suffering for the past more than five decades. So between Hamas and Israel, who defend yourself? They say defend. Israel and Hamas, who defending yourself? That's what I wanted to know. Because Pierre Morgan, when you a program, he always talking about Hamas is tolerance. Hamas and Israel, who is tolerance? Well, uh, I, when someone says to me, what about October 7th? I say, what about October 6th, 5th? Fourth, third, second, first. What about the previous October? What about the October before that? What about all the Octobers in the last uh, 75 years and more? What about the October of 1948 when the Palestinian people were driven out in their hundreds of thousands? Some of them as refugees still in Gaza. Others scattered across the world to the four corners of the earth, from the Arctic Circle to uh, South America, every part of Europe, Africa, Asia, the Arab world. What about those Octobers? What about the Octobers in which the people of the West Bank and Gaza have been systematically starved, slaughtered, invaded, occupied, repressed, imprisoned, tortured? What about all those Octobers? The story doesn't begin when Sky News turns up. That's not when the clock begins. The clock begins when it began. The story began when the story began. And it began in the promise more than a hundred years ago by the British government, which promised to one group of people the land which belonged to an entirely different group of people and promised it to them, but with the proviso that nothing will be done that will prejudice the rights of those whose land it actually is and then completely ignored and defied that second paragraph of the promise. October 7th, terrorism? You want to talk to me, Pierce, about terrorism? The people running Israel today invented modern terrorism. They tried to murder Winston Churchill when he was fighting Adolf Hitler. 
They tried to bomb the foreign office when we were at war with Adolf Hitler. They murdered a British minister, Lord Moyne. They murdered the United Nations envoy, Count Bernadotte. They murdered British soldiers, service people, policemen, civil servants. They invented terrorism. There's a reason, you know, and why the late Her Majesty the Queen never, ever, ever visited Israel. Although she went everywhere else in the world, she would never visit Israel. Why? Because British citizens, servicemen, policemen, civil servants, British government institutions were murdered and destroyed by terrorists from exactly the same political organization founded by Jabotinsky, calling themselves revisionists, fashioning themselves upon Mussolini's fascism. These people are running Israel today. That's why the Queen never went there. She refused to go there. Well, if it's good enough for Her Majesty, God rest her soul, good enough for me. Michael, last call, I think, of the evening from Nova Scotia in Canada on Biden. Michael, go ahead, please. Hello, George. My name is Michel. I'm a bilingual French-Canadian, and I'm living in Nova Scotia. My apologies. And You're I... welcome, sir. <laughs> I'm I, I'm a Catholic living in Nova Scotia, um, watching how, uh, like your previous caller said, our honesty, honorability, integrity, and reliability has disappeared in everybody, and the COVID nineteen was like. Um, a form of vampirism that happened over the world with half the professionals going along, being forced by their union to be vaccinated, and then having to choose between either keeping a job or and not saying anything or leaving their work. And we are facing um, 30% lack of health personnel. They left because they didn't want to be vaccinated. We had police that became very abusive due to Trudeau uh, forcism. Um, and I am watching that most of the professional educated under the Jesuit system in Canada have become professional gangsters. Well, I think you're right, uh, and it's not restricted to Canada, but Canada is a pretty good case in point. I mean, the people running Canada are supposedly the Liberals. What's liberal about Justin Trudeau? Sure, he wears the rainbow, he's left his wife, he's often seen in the company of, of uh, handsome, comely young men. I don't know if he takes a toke or two, but that would be the only smattering of liberalism in uh, Justin Trudeau, wouldn't it? His handling of the COVID, his handling of the truckers, his handling of anyone who stood up for their own rights over their own bodies, over their right to uh, refuse forced med medication, what was liberal about that? What is liberal about supporting Netanyahu on a murderous fascistic rampage against unarmed civilian women and children? What's liberal about supporting Zelensky and the Azov and the Nazi battalions of the Black Hundreds? of Ukrainian nationalism. What's liberal about that? And that is true 
across all of the Western countries who claim to stand for things the direct opposite of which they are doing and imposing. Don't get me started on Trudeau, Michel, uh, but God bless you, a Roman Catholic in Nova Scotia, and my apologies for getting your name wrong. I've got to clear the lines because there's a legend, Norma, in Bristol, who wants to talk to us. Norma, welcome. Hello, George. I am... Um... I just wanted to relay a couple of little stories because there's so much horrors and things we're hearing about no ceasefire from the Parliament. And it's all very despairing and depressing. I just wanted to say two little stories about how some people are very nice. Um, and they, uh, this is it. Um, when my husband died, the next day, a man from the, um, was going to service my boiler. He came around and I told him and he left. And then an hour later, he rang the bell and he gave me a big bunch of flowers. Now, I never, I, hadn't, I didn't know him. And similarly, a friend of mine from London rang me yesterday and she's 86 years and a year older than me. And she told me that a young man saw her struggling with her shopping and he went out of his way, took her shopping, and made sure that she got on the bus. And, of course, you know, you've, um, you and um, most, they've, you've always been very kind to me. But just to make a change, I thought, um, these people were strangers, but they, they had something so nice about them. So I thought I'd finish the show on a gentle note. <laughs> Well, look, uh, Norma, there's two kinds of people in the world and there's two competing uh, forces within each of us. Uh, if I make a, if you like, a, a, a metaphor of it, uh, there's a good and a bad on either of our shoulders and our conscience tells us uh, what we should be doing and when we have done the wrong thing and the same is true in the world as a whole. Uh, for every gangster and thief and immoral thug and liar and cheat that there is in the world, there are others who are positively saintly. And we all come across them. I was myself today at a nativity play where a very idealized uh, version of, uh, of uh, Bethlehem was the backdrop uh, to it. But all these little children dressed up, singing about the baby Jesus and so on. This is purity and goodness. All these teachers who often in their own time uh, made it all possible the parish priest sitting next to me, uh, filled with Christian feeling and, and goodwill, the other parents uh, that were all around me are all examples of goodness. And goodness is everywhere, just as evil is present everywhere. Goodness also is present everywhere. And our job, my job, I have always seen it this way, is to do what I can to ensure that good vanquishes evil. And that within myself, I always follow what my conscience tells me is good rather than evil. And if we all do that, a better world will result for our children and their children. Norma in Bristol, bringing the show to an end. I'm sorry that we have overshot again, not least because it cost me more money. Uh, when we do, the votes cast were 33,672. And 99%, 95%, 97%, 94% say that Putin, rather than Biden, commands more respect around the world. A no-brainer, 
in a way, but that so many people voted in this poll to express that no-brainer. Ought to be significant. Ought to be regarded as significant. Well, look, breaking news in the last few minutes, the U.S. House of Representatives has just voted in favor of giving more power to the impeachment inquiry into President Biden over corruption allegations. This vote now formally authorizes the congressional investigation, which will lead to the impeachment of Joe Biden. The vote was 221 votes in favor, 212 votes against. That may very well turn out to be hugely significant. We'll discuss it in our 300th edition of the mother of all talk shows on Sunday. That's right. On Sunday, an auspicious day, the 300th edition of the mother of all talk shows, which millions of people are watching all or in part every single week. Thanks to you. Good night.